Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the, the group that's here tonight, Lord. I pray for those, Lord, that still may be trying to get here, Lord, and, or for whatever reason, Lord, have just decided that it's not that important to be in church, Lord. I pray you just uh, show them, uh, Lord, the error of their thinking there, Lord, and I just mm -hmm. pray that you bring the folks out, Lord. I pray for uh, those of us that are here tonight, uh, Lord, that we would just get a blessing uh, out of what we're about to hear and, and learn, Lord, about science and the Bible, Lord, and the origins of it, Lord, and I just pray, God, that it would be a blessing and an encouragement to us as believers to take a stand, Lord, on, on the truth yeah, of the Word of God, God, Lord, and I just thank you for Brother Deans for the work and for the effort that he's put into this, Lord, and I just pray, Lord, that we would be an encouragement and a blessing to him as well, Lord, in the time that he's here, Lord, bless us now tonight, Lord, give us a good night together, in Christ's name we pray, amen. 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 Well, it is good to be here. And uh, this is a Science and, and the Bible Conference. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the Science and Bible tonight as a result. Amen. Uh, I'm Dr. Carl Deans, Burning Break Ministries, Pensacola, Florida. And uh, you can uh, get these videos and these tapes uh, on burningbrightministries.com. That's my website. Uh, we're, we're broadcasting live on Beetle right now. It doesn't seem to be archiving onto the Beetle, my Beetle Burning Bright TV uh, website right now. But uh, Brother Ed is uh, getting these videos, and as soon as I get the videos and get home, I'll upload them to my website so you can watch them later. Or, you know, you have friends and enemies and family that will want to watch these, all three. You know, I, I've, I've learned that the, you have those, those three... Those three, they don't want to watch. They want to watch what's going on, so uh, they'll be made available. But right now, we're broadcasting live over Beetle. So those of you out in the world that are watching, appreciate you, you tuning in. All right, uh, here's our key verses that uh, our theme verses: Genesis 1:1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And then we have another theme verse: Psalms 19:1 to 3. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day utter speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Amen. And then here's the one, here's our warning. O Timothy, 1 Timothy 6.10. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings, and oppositions of science falsely so called. All right, I put this slide up here, just kind of review what you're going to learn in this seminar. This is not your typical, you know, uh, go for the throat, uh, anti-Darwinian uh, lectures. This is not. This is really to show you how the Bible influenced science and scientific thought. Now, based on what we, we learned last night, did the Bible influence science and scientific thought? Amen. Yes, class. See? So you're already. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you more meat as we go through the night. you got to hang with me, but... I gave, you, I gave you a broad overview last night. I told you what I was going to tell you. So you already know the answers. And what I'm going to do is give you more information. Is it going to fill it and reinforce it? I, uh, we're, we're going to learn that modern science was made possible because of the biblical worldview. Is that true or false? I told you that last night. So, But we're going to put more meat to that one. You see? How the Bible influenced science. What I want you to see is that you did not have... You did not have science, true biblical science, until you got the Reformation Bibles out and the Reformation Bible and ref -hearted. And that gave people freedom to, to search and to do things. And they saw things in the Bible that made them question the universe as it was and question the Roman Catholic Church and its, its system of science. Uh, that many of the scientists today had the beginning in the Reformation. Well, I've told you that many times. You're going you're to see that in the history tomorrow when I go through the history. And then that naturalistic science of today is being vigorously questioned and, uh, and repudiated. That's You're going to see that like Sunday night. We're going to really hit that hard. And so uh, this will make you understand why we're in the mess we're in. Yes, amen. And I'm also going to arm you with uh, tools of the trade as far as uh, fighting against Darwinism. You're going to get some of that. But it helps for us to be a little bit smarter with the idea that science in itself is not bad. Right. Yeah. Biblical science, we were the one in science. True science. The world was in a dark age until Christians started exploring the world as they knew it. They had the 
proper world view from the gospel when we started exploring the world and the universe and the, and the solar system universe. And uh, so we were the ones that started science. Now what's happened in the last 50 to 75 years is the thing flipped ever since Darwin and then it started, Darwin started gaining traction and, uniform, and naturalistic science, uh, uniformitism, uniformitarianism took over, which is not biblical. This idea that everything's been the same since the beginning of time, and time is going either way, uh, that's not a biblical view. And ever when, when that hit, and then the Darwinism hit, then for some reason science, and science started to go against the Bible, uh, and you start seeing that in this, uh, the things that actually started uh, right about the time of uh, the 1700s, 1750s with the rationalism and stuff. But we'll go through all that. But the idea that naturalistic, naturalistic science of today is being vigorously questioned and repudiated. In other words, we're not just questioning it, now we're going for its throat. Because they've had 150 years to prove Darwin in, in Darwinianism, uh, and they haven't done it. So they came up with a thing called Neo-Darwinism. I'm not pronouncing it right. <coughs> and that ain't working either. Right. So uh, there is no Neo-Neo. I mean, right. Right. <laughs> three strikes, you're out. Okay. Okay. So now we're, we're, we're starting to repudiate it, and you're going to see that. So how the Bible influenced science, scientific thought, yes, it you understand that, and you're going to see that's going to put in the whole thing. So it's a different, different thing than just you know, punch, you know, pictures of fossils and, and tribulites and man walk, footprints of man walking with dinosaurs and stuff. You, you can find that on the web anywhere. I think you just calm down. Right here, right? <laughs> this is different. You can't find this. What I'm going to teach you here, Amen. it's not on the web. That's why we're putting it on the web. This right yeah. here. This is ed this is to educate us. Us uh, people that believe the book, some of us, some folks don't believe in the King James Version Bible, but maybe it'll even help them. At least they're Christians and they want to want to believe. They want to believe what God has said. So, all right, what is science? That's where we were at, and then we had to take a break last night. Science in the Bible. So we stop at this verse here, Second Peter three three to four. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking yeah. after their own lust. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? Where is Jesus, they're saying. He hasn't come. He hasn't come for 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. For since the Father's fellow slings continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Isn't that what they're saying? Mm -hmm. That's uniform, uniformitarianism. Right. You're, you're in the last days, folks, because that's what they're teaching in your high schools right now. Yeah. And aren't they saying, well, where is Jesus? Yeah, yeah. Where is it? Because we had some nut jobs that try to date the rapture. <laughs> and now they're saying, we're, hey, the promise is still there. Just like when, in Noah's day, Noah says a flood's coming. You know, the day after the flood, everybody <laughs> believed in the flood. Yeah. The day after the rapture, guess what? I won't be believers. There'll be a lot of believers. I said, whoa, they might have had something there. Yeah, like, see ya. <laughs> see ya. Okay. All right. This is naturalistic science. What is it? It's processes of the present. Or Dr. Henry Moore says, processes of the present cannot be extrapolated into those in the distant past and distant future. In other words, what you're seeing today, it's guesswork that it happened a million years ago or a million years. It's going to be the same a million years in the future. You cannot, you cannot with certainty say that it's always been that way. Uh, when, when, it, when God created Adam and Eve, did he create them as babies or what did he create them as? Full grown. See, that, that beats natu naturalistic science can't understand that. Yeah. But God, when he created Adam and Eve, they were full grown. How about the, how about the animals swimming in the ocean? Full grown. Yeah. So things have not always been the same as they were. Uniformitarianism is the premise on which naturalistic science and evolution is based. Uniformitarianism, therefore, is a philosophy. It is science. Because I define science. Science, you have to observe it. It has to be reproduced, you know, have to be reproducible and all that stuff. So it's a philosophy, it's not a science. It's a big key when you're talking to your Darwinian friends. 
That's why we say it's a philosophy. Darwinism is a, is a uh, it might as well just be another religion. Because it's a philosophy, it can't be proven scientifically. In fact, it can be disproved scientifically. Yeah. Here's Dr. Isaac Asimov. Now, he was a well-known writer of fiction and non-fiction books. He wrote over 200 books. He's an atheist, a humanist, and a rationalist. Now, this word humanist now is taken on a different connotation. Back in the Reformation time, a humanist was a good guy. A humanist was interested in the, the human being as an individual, not as, a, as an entity, uh, a part of a cog in a society. So, but nowadays, humanists believe, you know, let's... Man is the measure of all things. So, and he's a rationalist. That means I think from my brain. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in any outside influence. I, I can think with my, with my head. He wrote a commentary on Genesis. Amazing. He picked a Bible. And he took a King James Version Bible to make commentary on it. In the beginning, God is, is the title, Science Faces God in the Book of Genesis. So Isaac Asimov is doing the same thing that I'm doing, but he's doing it backwards. You get that? You see, you're, you should be happy I'm teaching you this science in the Bible instead of Isaac Asimov. Yeah. Amen. Because he, he, this is what he thinks. This is a couple of quotes out of, his, out of his book. The Bible is the most read book that has ever existed. True. And there are uncounted millions of people in the world who, even today, take it for granted that it is an inspired word of God. True. Yeah, I'm looking at you. You're looking at one. I just did a conference on that last weekend. And if you don't know after that conference, and I believe King James Version Bible is the inspired word of God, you weren't listening. <laughs> but it's the last one standing. You take all, you take the King James Version Bible, and you can put all the other Bibles to the right. All the modern translations since 1880, just put them on the right. They belong in a trash can. Amen. The King James Amen. Bible is stand. All those Bibles agree to disagree against this one book, which came from the Reformation, came from King James, who was anti-Catholic and pro-Bible. Okay, now look what he says. Granted, that is the spire word of God. That is literally true at every point. So he must know us. How does he know us? So there, there must be others of us out there. Because has Isaac Asimov ever been to your church, Brother Struble? He's never <laughs> talked to me. So he must have talked to somebody. That there are no mistakes. Oh, look at this. Every point. That there are no mistakes or contradictions, except where these can be traced to errors in copying or in translation. Right well, copying or translation. Then we talk about the seven editions. Yeah. Right. To get it back to the pure, purity of the, of the 1611 text. Right. And the Committee of... Uh, 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 revisions in 1852 said the purifying of the text was accomplished. That's why there has no been no more editions of the of the AB 1611. It's done. Okay. I took. It's like an apple on a tree. Pulled the apple off the yep. tree. Finny, now enjoy. Amen. Right. right now, here's the next thing he says. There are undoubtedly many who do not realize. Oh, spare us. Oh. Realize that the authorized version, the King James Bible, so that's what he's using, the one with which English-speaking Protestants are most familiar, is a translation. And who, therefore, since we don't, know, we don't understand that it's a translation, but we, therefore, since we don't understand it's a translation, we believe that every one of its words is inspired and infallible. Yeah, as a matter of fact, we do, Isaac. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And we do understand it's a translation. Who wouldn't want you to have a Bible in your own language? Yeah. I ask that question over time. <laughs> who, who, who wouldn't want you to have a Bible in your own language? Oh, the Roman Catholic Church. Amen. The devil. Yeah. 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 In fact, in the Bible, when it talks about translation, I don't, you know, for, just to refresh you, every time I translate, the word translation is used in the Bible. It's always from better. It's always better. Mm -hmm. yeah. But anyway. One of its words are, is inspired and infallible. Against these strong, unwavering, and undeviating beliefs. Doesn't that make you feel good? Yes, sir. <laughs> Isaac, Amen. Isaac is having, he's just kind of having a little hissy fit there. Why don't these people get it? Ed, why don't these people get it? <laughs> Amen. I hope I never get it. <laughs> why don't these people get it? You know why we don't get it? Because Isaac, you're wrong. Yeah. 
He died in 2008. The Bible says for the wages of sin is death. He's changed his mind now, brother. He's probably changed his mind. He's Bible believer now. Slowly, okay, the undeniably, believe, the slowly developing views of scientists has always had to fight. And that's not, that's, that's not true, is it? Because we were the ones that invented science. He needs to study a little bit more of his history. But anyway, now this is what this is the key one here. Biological evolution. No such thing, folks. Amen. Amen. You saw that machine in that the the the, uh, the spinneroo on the on that bacterium is called a flagellum. For, I don't know. That's probably Latin for something. True. That's Latin for spinneroo. You saw that last night. Ain't no way. There ain't no way that thing happened by accident. It had no way that had my biological evolution. No. If that happened by evolution, then the alternator in your car happened by evolution. Yeah. Right. Amen. It didn't have a designer, it didn't have a maker. Right. And you saw that that, that flip doodle uh, whirly gig on that bacteria was a whole lot more sophisticated. And it put itself together. Did you see that? Yeah. It yeah. self assembled yeah. itself. Yeah. It took Amen. the materials it needed and self assembled itself. Right. Yeah. Uh, hello, this is like me, you know. Oh, yeah. You want to talk about supernatural. How do you do that? Self assembles itself. Yeah. Put the pieces. Don't, just don't. Even, you don't even have the pieces. You just have the elements. And it takes the elements it easy. Okay, I'm you know. For instance, it's considered a fact of nature by almost all biologists. <laughs> it's considered a fact. Yeah. There may be, and indeed are, many arguments over the mechanics of evolution, but none over the fact, just as we may not understand the workings of an automobile engine. Oh, he has to use that illustration. I think I've heard that before. Does an automobile engine have a designer? Yeah. And it has a maker, does it? Why would you use something like that to help my cause here? Okay. Working of an automobile engine, and yet be certain that a car in good working order will move if we turn the key and step on the gas. You know why you can be confident of that, Isaac? Is because there was a designer and there was a maker. Now, there are millions of people out there who are strongly and emotionally opposed to the notion of biological evolution, even though they know little or nothing about the evidence and rationale behind it. I'm going to fix that problem in the next three days, two days, whatever. You hang with me. You're going to, you already have a boatload of information already. No, little or nothing about the evidence and rationale behind it. No, we know, Isaac, we know an awful lot about the evidence and rationale behind it. It is enough for them that the Bible states thus and so. And you know what? That is true. The Bible says in the beginning God created heaven and earth. That's all God expects us to know. Do you understand that? We know the world exists according to Hebrews chapter 11 because God said it. A lost man knows that the world, that God exists because he can look at the heavens and know there's a creator. Yes. It's, it's backwards. It is enough for them that the Bible states thus and so. The argument ends there. Yeah, it ends there. Look at my Bible here. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. Let me just, if I have a Bible. Oh, here it is. Let me show you this. You believe the world exists because God told you so. Amen. Right. I know this sounds weird. You know me, I used to fly F-4s and did space operations. And I had to study uh, Laplace. Uh, what do you call it? The uh, Laplace Con, or whatever. I had to study all that stuff. I want to say Laplace transforms. Is that possible? <laughs> Did I study that stuff? I don't even know if it's a concept anymore. I've, I've forgotten more than I, I learned. But anyway, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You believe because God told you so. Mm -hmm. Right, right. For it, by El, for it, for by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith, verse 3, you might, might want to mark this down in your Bible. Through faith, we, we understand that the worlds are framed by the word of God, so that things are seen 
Things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. What's that faith? We believe what God has said. Yeah. So he's got us right. He's got us pegged right. But evolution and all that is not a fact. Let me, let's go to the next uh, slide here. Dear Dr. Asimov, this is my little uh, two-year-old granddaughter. Here. <laughs> a translation can be inspired in Acts chapter 2. You think God can't translate? Your, that means he can't hear Spanish, he can't hear a, a German person's... Uh, he was the one invented languages, Isaac, yeah. in the Tower of Babel. Yeah. 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 The whole Reformation was about getting the Bible into the hands of the people in their language, called the vernacular. Yeah. Yeah. So God can do <coughs> translation. And he did an excellent job. In fact, the translation is better than the original. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, amen. Yeah. I, I accept I accept what science says except when science makes stuff up. Okay? Most biologists is not all biologists. That's right. Just the majority is not always right. No. An engine works because it is a designer and maker. And then the last thing Isaac I don't think. See, they think we're dumb thumps. Because I have because we, we go by the Bible. No, we're not as dumb as you think, buddy. We're not as dumb as you think. You're probably a lot smarter now. Amen. You probably figured it out by now. You've been. You died in 2008. No. Yeah. If you had not, if you don't receive the Lord Jesus, if you hadn't received the Lord Jesus Christ, he, according to that Bible, according to Jesus Christ, he's in hell. He's been burning in hell for five years now. All right. That is not a nice thing. I'm not happy about that. I liked Isaac Asimov. Yeah. Yep. But when it comes to this. He wrote some great stuff. In fact, he wrote a great book on genetics. He wrote a great book on, on chemistry and things. He wrote not just on science fiction, but all kinds of Turner books. And some people, you know, I wrote about all, and he wrote a lot of good books, interesting books, thought-provoking books. You know, things about the future. Get you challenged and thinking, what would you, but. He obviously wasn't saved. Uh, probably not. Not unless something happened right towards the end. Yeah, Isaac, we know a little bit more than you do now. Here, anybody remember this article, Newsweek? This was in 1988. Uh, the search for Adam and Eve. Scientists explore a controversial theory about man's origins. Origins. What they do is they look through the genetic. They, they took, um, like, uh, I'll, I'm really paraphrasing this. Is, this is way off base, probably. So maybe, if you want to get the details, you read the article. But let's say they took uh, the genetic material of about 150 people spread out over the world. And when they worked with the genetic material, you know what they came up with? They, were looked, they thought that they would find people had come from different places. Because they think that man evolved from in different places, right? But no, they found out that all of us come from one woman. Yeah. Where have we heard that before? Imagine hmm. <laughs> that. Now, here's, here's the quote. Here's a funny quote. When scientists announced their discovery of Eve last, Eve last year, they rekindled perhaps the oldest human debate. Yeah. Where did we come from? They also, in some sense, no, in a real sense, <laughs> confirmed the belief that existed long before the, uh-uh, they mentioned the Bible. Right. Uh, yeah, like back, back in Noah's day, back in Adam and Eve, they probably, uh, Eve probably told her, her children, uh, you know, we all, you all came from me and the two grandchildren and the grandchildren. Goes all the way back, you know, six thousand years. But they're talking about legend. We all came. Back, the Bible says we came from one woman. All right. Now, uh, since then, they've been working on trying to find Adam. And I just found a recent article, 2013, because there are some articles coming out there say, "Oh no, these guys are wrong and everything." But they are still looking for. They were. They they haven't thrown Eve away, and they're still looking. They look. You know, Eve. Eve is. is Eve's. Still there in the literature. And in 2013, they found Adam. Or they're looking for Adam. And now here's what they said. Now, I got the, I got the article with that one. But they said, you know, the only way you can figure out who, because Eve had to come from, uh, you know, we all had to come from some man. There has to be a man. So they're saying that Eve, Eve probably came from her, the genetic material, whatever, 
came from her father. Oh. Now think about that. Think of that for a second. So they are admitting that it had to be somebody, obviously, from her in her lineage. It couldn't have been her husband. Her husband couldn't have, they say the husband couldn't have given her the genetic material. It had to be her father. Now we, in other words, it had to be someone right next to her. Now, we know the answer from the Bible, right? It's basically her, her brother or whatever. We're getting close. Yeah. But they, they won't admit it. They won't admit it. Yeah. The other, there's another option out there that she got a bone. She was taken from the genetic material of the Adam. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why. So they stopped. They got Eve and they, they're looking for Adam. And they think the only, the only, or they found him and the only, the only explanation is that he was Eve's father. No, there's another explanation for that. Eve's husband. <laughs> yep. Isn't that something? Science finally catches up to the Bible. Yeah. Yeah. The most controversial implication of the genetics work is that modern humans didn't slowly and, and ex didn't uh, yeah, slowly and inexorably evolve in different roles, as many anthropologists believe. The evolution from archaic to modern Homo sapiens, and we don't believe in evolution, but this, look at this. Evolution from archaic to modern Homo sapiens seems to have occurred in only one place, Eve's family. Uh -huh. And they, not in this order, but another order, she must, it must have been her dad. That's where they'll, isn't that wild? But we know it's Adam. Here's Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke. And he wrote 2001 A Space uh, Odyssey, or at least to help with the screenplay, and then wrote the book. This is Arthur C. Clarke. Now he's another great guy, a science fiction writer, etc., well known. Mm -hmm. And in 2001 Space Odyssey, maybe if I have time on Sunday, I'll, I'll, I'll show you something about this. It's very interesting. But 2001 Space Odyssey, if you've seen the beginning, most people don't understand the beginning. But the beginning, you've got a bunch of monkeys running around. If you remember, a bunch of monkeys running around, uh, pre-hominid or something. And then they wake up in the book, a guy named Moon Watcher wakes up in the middle of the night or whatever, and he sees this monolith. This looked like tombstone, black tombstone. Well, what it does is somehow um, messes with his mind or genetics or whatever. And he gets the big idea after that that, you know, and they're all struggling for food. All these, all these hominids are struggling and competing. He gets the idea of using a, a bone as a weapon, a tool. And so he gets to kill, he kills an animal. And then so he and his, the guys that were exposed to this monolith, they make the next evolutionary step, right? And then it breaks, and then they finally find another one of these monoliths on the moon. And the idea is that extraterrestrials came and helped us. Right. Yeah. Our, uh, right. Now, keep that in mind when I show you this, this video tomorrow. That extraterrestrials came and helped us. Have you ever heard that before? You're starting to come back, the extraterrestrials are actually came, and or we got seeded from Mars and all this stuff. <laughs> why, why is it we couldn't seed Mars? Why is it we and Earth couldn't seed Mars? Instead of Mars seeding us. Right. And you never think about that. But anyway, that's Arthur C. Clarke. He wrote that screenplay. But here's, here's some things that uh, he's done. Well-known science fiction writer. Invented the communication satellite. He wrote some articles about the communication satellite before we even had rockets to take them up there. Best known for being the co-writer of the screenplay 2001 Space Odyssey. He's not positive towards religion. Uh, he's not anti anti-religion, but he's not really positive towards it, had, pan had pantheists put on his dog tags when he was in World War II. So, so he's a pantheist. That's kind of a, you don't want to be an atheist, but you don't want to be a Christian either, so you, you take the easier. God is in, or we'll talk about that. So, oh, well, that looks like a mad scientist there. Right. Arthur C. Clarke. This is what Arthur C. Clarke, this is his three laws. Now think about this. When a distinguished but elderly scientist states that something is possible, he almost certainly is right. When he's saying, and he's saying somebody older is older than 30 years old. <laughs> when, he state, or 30 or 40, when he states that something is impossible, he's very probably wrong. And he's put, I've watched this, and that, that is a maxim, that is a law. That has actually happened in my lifetime in 50 years. People would say this is impossible, and next thing yeah. you know, some young guy figures out how to do it. Right? Right. The only way of discovering the limits of possible is to venture a little way past them into the impossible. And uh, you've got people that are always telling, like uh, uh, 
Elon Musk, he's built the SpaceX uh, rockets out there in California. And uh, a lot of people were possible. The guys that were in NASA and all say, it's impossible. You can't, you can't do that. You're just by, hey, he's done it. Okay? He's actually sent up rockets up to the International Space Station. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. What we're doing right there, live broadcasting to the whole world, uh, low out there, you know, guys, out, we, that is, to, to us, even 20 years ago, we would have considered it magic. Yeah. You, know? yeah. you guys got your cell phone, you get text and pictures and all that. Well, I want to read you a couple of things from his book, Profiles of the Future. It was written in 1967. At least that's a copyright. I think that's the earlier one. And I, I don't want to take a whole lot of time doing this. But this failure of nerve, let me just read you some of the things where science is wrong, was really wrong. This is out of his Hazards of Prophecy. The failure of nerve and the failure of imagination. Before one attempts to set up in business as a prophet, it is instructive to see what success others made of this dangerous occupation. It is even more instructive to see where they have failed. In other words, scientists a lot of times say, well, what's possible in the future? And that's not the necessary the idea of speculating the future. What I want you to see is how many times that science got it wrong. That's what I want you to see from this. With monotonous regularity, apparently competent men have laid down the law about what is technically possible or impossible, and have been proved utterly wrong, sometimes while the ink was scarcely dry from their pens. On careful analysis, it appears that these debacles uh, the, uh, Fail, uh, fall into two classes, which I'll call failures of nerve and failure of imagination. All right? So let me, he gives a few examples of where these guys are all fouled up. It is now possible for us to recall the mental climate which existed when the first was, uh, to recall the, the mental climate which existed when the first locomotives were being built. And critics gravely asserted that suffocation lay in wait for anyone who reached the awful speed of 30 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. Amen. Yep. It is equally difficult to believe. Oh, it is now impossible for us to recall the mental climate. Okay. And he says, it is equally difficult to believe that only 80 years ago, the idea of the domestic electric light was poo-pooed by all the experts with the exception of a 31-year-old American inventor named Thomas Alva Edison. When gas securities nosedived in 1878 because Edison, already a former formidable figure with the phonograph and the carbon microphone to his credit, so you know, he, had a, he had a track record, announced that he was working on the incandescent lamp, the British Parliament set up a committee to look into the... The distinguished witnesses reported to the relief of the gas companies that Edison's ideas were good enough for our transatlantic friends, this is the Brits, but unworthy of the attention of practical or scientific men. Mm. And Sir William Pierce, engineer-in-chief of the British Post Office, roundly declared that subdivision of the electric light is an absolute ignis fat, uh, fatus. What that means is swamp gas, electric <laughs> swamp gas. And uh, anyway. The, elect, the scientific absurdity being pillared, be it noted, is not some wild and woolly dream like perpetual motion, but the humble little electric light bulb, which three generations of men have taken for granted, except when it burns out and leaves them in the dark. <laughs> the most famous and perhaps the most instructive failures of nerve have occurred in the fields of aero and air astronautics, but I, I remember. You know, I, I grew up in this. At the beginning of the 20th century, scientists were almost unanimous in declaring that heavier than air flight was impossible and that anyone who attempted to build an airplane was a fool. What was telling them it was a fool? Scientists. The great American astronomer Sermon, Simon Newcomb wrote a celebrated essay which concluded the demonstration that no possible combination of known substances, known forms of machinery, and known forms of force can be united in practical machine by which man can fly, shall fly long distance through the air seems to the writer as complete as it is possible for the demonstration of any fa physical fact to be. He's saying flying is impossible yeah. with the known stuff. But you know, at least he was broad-minded, he says, at least he was sufficiently broad-minded to admit that some wholly new discovery, he mentioned the neutralization of gravity might make flight practical. 
Mm. Now we're laughing at these guys, but that's only 100 years ago. That's 120 years ago. These are scientists are saying you are not going to get an airplane to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. Impossible. It can't be done. And it goes on and on. I mean, there's just here. I'll just here's a quote. Here's a quote from a scientist. Now, mathematics. Got to be careful with mathematics. Mathematics is a great tool, but it's garbage in, garbage out if you're not careful. So you get these physicists up here, and they're starting to talk about. I watched one physicist do this thing, and he says, you know what's great about mathematics? He says, I can move this constant over to this side, and now I have nothing. And you know what that means? Since I have nothing, I have energy out of nothing. Okay, whatever makes your boat float, buddy. <laughs> but my, you know, my algebra professors wouldn't let me do that. Yeah. But if you, if you want to get rid of it, you can do that. But we know that God, just from reading Hebrews, you know, you don't have to tell us that. We knew that already from Hebrews chapter 11, 1, 2, and 3, that God created everything out of nothing. A dumb thump up in West Virginia, you know, so-called dumb thump Bible believer in West Virginia uh, that uh, raised chickens and uh, had not never been to school, just reads his Bible. He knew that God created everything out of nothing. Yeah. We don't need to have some scientist move a constant over to one side and over the other. <laughs> Duh. <laughs> Like I said, if I did that, I'd get zero. They would not give me impartial credit. Uh, but he's, he can do what he wants. The foolish idea of shooting at the moon is an example of the absurd <coughs> length to which vicious specialization will carry scientists working in thought-tight compartments. Let us critically examine the proposal. For a projectile entirely to escape the gravitation on the Earth, it needs a velocity of seven miles a second. The thermal energy is a gram at the speed is 15,180 calories. The energy of our most violent explosive nitroglycerin is less than 1,500 calories per gram. Consequently, even had the explosive nothing to carry, it has only one-tenth of the energy necessary to escape the Earth. Hence, the proposition appears to be basically impossible. And this is what, this is what Arthur C. Clarke says. Indignant readers in the Colombo Private Library pointed angrily to the silence notice when I discovered this little gem. It is worth examining it in some detail to see just how vicious specialization, if one may coin a phrase, led the professor so badly astray. In other words, Arthur C. Clarke just pushed out laughing. <laughs> and you know, you can take hydrogen and oxygen and get a whole lot of things, and then you have a converging and diverging nozzle, and action and reaction and all that stuff. And uh, while he was probably saying this, I don't know when it was, oh, 1926, he would, it, was, it should be in 1926, I think that's around the time uh, Goddard was firing his rockets out of Roswell, you know, and, and Oberth and those guys were working uh, to build a rocket in Germany. And on, if you want to look at these later, it's, uh, it's a hoot. Science can be wrong. Yeah. 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 And it's been wrong in the last hundred years. In the in the in the sight of your eyes, they've been wrong. They've been wrong. And they're gonna they're wrong in, on uh, Darwinism. They're totally wrong. And they've had 150 years to to know to, to find and prove it, and they can't prove it because it's wrong. Amen. Okay, what do we cover? What is science? All right, science. It's knowledge. It's demonstrated truths. Uh, sciences are things like mathematics with numbers, but uh, uh, it can be applied to other, other uh, uh, disciplines. They try, to make it, they try to make everything one big formula. And you can't, you know, human nature is hard to make a formula. Like political science, it's hard to make politics science. Okay? We talked about Bacon. Uh, he was a he was a fellow that uh, believed in the scriptures and the volume, and that not only needed the scriptures, but also he needed uh, the uh, the creation, and that was the way to find truth. The scriptures kept you from error, but you had to observe. He found the empirical method. He was the one that said you can't just think about these things; you have to go and actually experiment and observe and see how things work. Okay. We talked about the four assumptions when it comes to science. Nature is understandable. All nature is subject to the same laws. It must be uh, measurable. Things must be measurable. And the simple uh, explanation is the, is the best one. Not all things are important in science, like the memory, birth of a child, a wedding, hitting a home run, 
um, you know, that type of thing, graduating from kindergarten. What science cannot do? Science cannot predict the coin toss. It can't make moral judgments. It can't tell you how to use the knowledge you gain. It cannot make aesthetic judgments. Like, um, that's a pretty colorful wall. That It can't do that. It, it can't draw conclusions about the supernatural. And it cannot be considered, as I said, it cannot be considered the ultimate truth. So when, some, when a scientist gets up there and proves to you something is impossible, can't happen, you better think twice. Especially if he uses math. When a guy gets up there and starts moving constants around and everything, yeah, because he's trying to make his equations work. Einstein did the same thing when he came up with the theory of relativity. He came up with a constant to make the universe static because his, his thing said the universe had a beginning and it was going to have an end. And Einstein, because of his philosophy, because of his philosophy, not his science, put a constant in there to make the world, the universe static. And within a few years, that constant was thrown out. Everybody knew that he just threw that in there. But he couldn't bring himself to believe that the universe was not static. And then science is not the final answer. Naturalistic science, it's a philosophy. Remember that. Because it's saying everything was the same from all the way back and all the way to the future. And you can't know that. You cannot know that. And we know from the Bible that's not true. We know that from the Bible that's not true. Well, we're coming up on probably a good time to break because I'm going to get into another lesson. And uh, maybe now it's time to take a little bit of break. And uh, I'm going to take a break now and then we'll come back and we'll get some more going. Yeah. 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 Yeah.